Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad you're joining us for the Roman study. So uh, we're going to get rolling here. Hope you've got a cup of coffee, a donut, uh, whatever it is you need. Uh, and we are going to dive into Romans chapter four this week. So your homework was chapter four, uh, just the first 12 verses. So uh, hopefully you got a chance to read that either sometime this week or maybe you came in here this morning. Grab a cup of coffee and a donut and read it. Either way is fine. It's just it helps us because I'm I'm kind of giving, I don't know, guideposts as we're reading together. I'm not really going verse by verse, word by word. I'm kind of trying to give an overall uh, guide for how we're reading Romans together. So it helps if you are able to get to that during the week. Uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12 is roughly, I don't know, roughly half the chapter, a little under half the chapter. And I'm preaching today on the second half of Romans chapter four. If you were in the first service, you may notice that we picked up uh, in worship at verse 13. Uh, that's just kind of the way the cookie crumbled as far as how fast we're going through Romans and what the church uh, yearly lectionary readings were. So some of the same stuff that I talked about in the sermon is gonna get covered today um in our study together and some of it is different because we're in the first part of the chapter beginning at verse one and you see that in chapter four we we're going to start talking about this dude right here abraham uh that's a eastern orthodox icon of abraham that probably is not what abraham looked like but i yeah it looks like angry gandalf if anybody's a fan of the lord of the rings and one of the reasons that I picked this icon is because it looks like angry Gandalf. Like, I feel like Abraham in this picture looks like he just walked in the room and all the great, 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 great grandkids were doing something they shouldn't be doing. And he's just like, I'm too old to put up with this. You know what I mean? Like, that's what he looks like. And so I picked this one. I picked this one because it's fun for me and I'm leading the study. So you're stuck with it. All right, so in chapter four, uh, Paul begins using Abraham as uh, his poster child for uh, justification by faith apart from works of the law. So last week, I said that one of Paul's big purposes in writing the book of Romans is what's called in Jewish circles, Midrash on scripture. Uh, when a Jewish rabbi says that they're going to provide midrash on scripture, it means, or, you know, a scholar, um, it means that they're providing commentary on scripture. So, and I also made the point that Paul is not making an argument about how things are, whether that's faith in God, relationship with one another as human beings, and then going to the Bible to cherry pick verses that are supposed to support his argument. That is not what he's doing. Remember, we made the point that Paul, you remember how many biblical references I took you through that Paul was making from Psalms and Isaiah, and he was all over the place. It was a lot, right? I mean, it was a lot to keep track of. And, and the point there was to show that Paul knows his Old Testament. And so when Paul reasons, he reasons from his understanding of the scriptures. He doesn't make an argument and then go cherry pick verses to support that argument. Rather, his argument is from a deep personal understanding of the Old Testament, which means that if you're going to argue with Paul, good luck. But it, it, but it also means that you'd be arguing with someone who deeply understands his Old Testament. 
So he doesn't cherry pick verses. Instead, he argues from his deep understanding of the Old Testament. So here in Romans chapter four, you have another example of that midrash. As a Jewish scholar, Paul is making an argument from the Old Testament. And so he's linking what he's saying in what you have marked as Romans chapter four with Genesis chapter 15. How do we know he's referencing specifically chapter 15? Well, because he says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Well, where is that verse? Let's, let's look at it, first of all, in Romans chapter 4, okay? In Romans chapter 4, just the first three verses. Everybody there with me? Yeah. Romans chapter 4, just the first three verses. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? So if he's going to say, what does the scripture say? We're in Romans chapter four. Yeah. Uh, so he says, what does the scripture say? So that means he's about to reference the Old Testament. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, where is that verse? That's in chapter 15 of Genesis. So I'm, I'm telling you that he's referencing specifically Genesis chapter 15, because that's where that verse is. Yeah, it's 15, 6. Very good, Carol. Good. So Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So that first bullet point that I have for you there on the slide, Paul's argument centers on both Genesis 15, verse 6, and a general understanding of the timeline of God's dealings with Abraham. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's look at it again. Going on from verse four. So chapter four of Romans, verse four and following. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him and justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Pause there. Look back at that first bullet point. Paul's arguing not only from Genesis chapter 15, specifically verse 6, but also from a general understanding of the timeline of God's dealings with Abraham. Go back to verse 9. No, excuse me, verse 10 of Romans chapter 4. He says, how then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? We're talking about timeline. Right now. The timeline of God's dealings with Abraham. Okay? So what does he go on to say? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. So when it says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, the Bible says that before Abraham is ever circumcised. The sign of circumcision comes after God makes the promise that Abraham believes it. He's not justified by a sign, a covenantal sign. He's justified by his faith in the promise, really in the promise giver. Everybody with me on that? Okay. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised uh, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now, clearly what Paul is doing here as well is, is beginning to make an argument from scripture that he will use to justify his own ministry in front of other, we've called them Hebraic Jews back in Jerusalem, Peter, the apostle Peter, the apostle John, because eventually Paul will have to defend his ministry to Gentiles. Why? What does Paul not require Gentile believers to do? 
He does not require Gentile believers to become circumcised in order to join the church, the body of Christ. Okay? And he's going to have to eventually justify that back in Jerusalem. So you see here his biblical argument for the idea that Abraham is the father of all who believe, not just those who are circumcised who are of the Jewish ethnicity, but those who are not Jewish in their ethnicity or in their spiritual background who become believers through Jesus Christ. They must be baptized. They don't have to be circumcised. Okay. So clearly that's part of what he's doing here. But but the larger theological argument here is about what saves a person. And he's arguing that Abraham is justified by his faith, which is counted to him as righteousness, apart from works of the law. And his argument centers on both Genesis chapter 15, 6, Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness, and his general understanding of the timeline of God's dealings with Abraham. God came and made Abraham a promise that he believed before the sign of circumcision was added. Everybody with Paul? Okay. Interestingly absent, the second bullet point that I've got for you there, interestingly absent is a discussion of the active agent in the covenant between God and Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. I just personally find this interesting that Paul leaves this out. But again, Paul's aim here is twofold. He wants to make a point about what justifies a person. He also wants to make a point about not having Gentiles have to submit to circumcision. Okay. So he's got a different aim in writing this letter than I would if I wrote it. But I personally find it interesting that Paul leaves out the, the, a discussion of the active agent between God and Abraham in Genesis 15. So keeping a bookmark or whatever in Romans 4, since Paul is really talking about Genesis chapter 15, we probably ought to just go over to Genesis chapter 15. What do you reckon? So let's go over there. So Genesis chapter 15 is God's covenant with Abraham. And I love the way this starts out. Somebody read just the first verse of chapter 15 really loud so that everybody can hear you because you're reading the word of God. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in the vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. You, your very great reward. I love that. God comes to Abram. His name is still Abram. And the very first thing God says to Abraham is not, Abram, I am God. You know, like in some really bad movie or something. You know, what I mean? or he doesn't come. He doesn't come to him and say, Abram, this is God. Fear before me. He comes to him, what's the first thing he says to Abram? Don't be afraid. I am your shield. What a thing to say to somebody. What does that mean? I am your shield. Protector. I'm your protection. I'm your cover. I'm your safety. I've got your back. You're my boy, Blue. <laughs> That's the Will Miller uninspired translation of God's word to Abram. You're my boy, Blue. Uh, what a thing to say. So when we talk in, in Christian circles about what God is asking of us is to enter into this relationship with him through the blood Jesus Christ shed for you. It's, it's not, it should not be misunderstood at, at all. We are talking about a God who made us to be in relationship with him. The first thing God said is God. He could have said anything in the world. What's the one thing he wants to say to Abram right out of the gate? Don't be afraid. I am your shield. And then he says your reward will be very great. Your reward for what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I lose a cat, I got to put up the... I mean, I wouldn't personally, but I got a daughter. You know what I mean? And when you got a daughter, you got to put up the reward for this cat, right? You know what I mean? Otherwise, I'll just say, oops, the fox has got one. You know what I mean? But I have a daughter. 
right? So we put up the reward for the cat. My wife's over here. I don't know if I need to put it up for her too. But anyway, so now she said, no, I'm, I'm good. So just for the daughter, I got to put up the reward for the cat, right? So you get a reward when you do something meriting the, the stated reward. God comes to Abram. Abram's done nothing at all. He doesn't ask Abram to do anything. He just says your reward will be very great. Reward for what? When, when people talk about, so, okay, speaking of my daughter, we were out for a walk because she, she doesn't have a dog, so she takes her old man for a walk. <laughs> and we, we went around the, the neighborhood and we're walking and um, we like to hold hands and, and she was talking to me about things and stuff. She just likes to talk to me about things and stuff. And she started talking to me about faith. And I, and I said, okay, well, tell me all about what you're thinking. And she said, I think it's sad that people do the things that they do that are disobedient to what God has asked us to do. And I said, I agree with you. That is sad. Why do you think it's sad? And she said, well, because I really paid attention this last year to what really happened to Jesus and what they did to him. And he went through all of that for you and me. He went through all of that. And the only thing he asked us to do was just obey. That's the only thing he asked us to do. And I don't think he's going to be happy when he gets back. And he's going to be like, I did all of that for you. And all I asked you to do was just obey me. And you couldn't even do that. And I'm like, you're right. He's probably, I mean, that's, that's. You kind of got it in a nutshell. I mean, he did all of that for us. And all he asked us to do was just say, yes, sir. You know. And so through the eyes of a, of a kid, a preteen. She sees that we've done nothing. And that what we've been asked isn't really much anything either. God comes to Abram and he says, your reward will be great. For what? God is so gracious and so loving and so kind. When people get hung up on God's anger, it's because it's deserved. Does that make sense outside my own head? So he's so loving. He comes to Abram and the first thing he says is, don't be afraid. Life is scary. Don't be afraid. And then the next thing he says is, not only is life scary, but it's scary if God comes to you. Right. Yeah. And so he says, don't be afraid. And then the next thing he says is, I am your shield. I've got your back. And then he says, you're going to get a reward for doing absolutely nothing. Grace upon grace upon love upon love. Look how God approaches it. OK. Then he keeps going. Verse two. But Abram said. In response to all that grace. But Abram said, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, uh, behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And here it is. There's a big verse. And he believed the Lord and he that is the Lord counted it to him that is Abram as righteousness. Okay. Abram has already been down to Egypt. He's already lied. He lied to Pharaoh. He put his poor wife in a position to Almost committed adultery. He put her in that position. Then he comes out with possessions that are not his own because Pharaoh is afraid of God, which he should rightly be. And so Abram's got what he's got, not by the sweat of his own brow. He didn't do it American Midwestern style. He didn't pull himself up by his bootstraps. He <laughs> raided Egypt on a lie. Okay. Y'all, I'm pretty sure I've read the Ten Commandments, and Abram's actions don't align with the Ten Commandments. 
Now, there are no Ten Commandments yet because Moses hasn't handed them over from God. But I've read the Ten Commandments, and I'm pretty sure that kind of behavior would not be looked well upon by most good old Missouri tenant congregations, right? If you had a pastor that acted like that, the elders would call him together and say, we believe that the Lord is calling you to use your gifts elsewhere. You know what I mean? If you acted that way. But what does the scripture say? But he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, Abram's got a smaller vision. I misspoke in the sermon of that. I just realized that reading this again. I misspoke in the sermon. I said that Abram wasn't worried about children. It wasn't his idea, but it is his idea, obviously. I just needed to reread chapter 15, so I apologize. I didn't mean to preach heresy. My head elder's in the room. Do you want to call a meeting with me, head elder? You can do that. But I've already apologized publicly. So I misspoke in the sermon. He is concerned about children, but he's concerned about children as his own heir. It's a smaller concern. And what's God concerned for in giving offspring to Abraham? Is it does it have to do with inheritance or his own name continuing? What's God concerned with in giving Abraham children? Eventually getting to Jesus. Eventually getting to Jesus and the salvation of the whole world. So the, the idea with Abram is not that I'm going to bless you. It's that I'm going to bless you and then you're going to become a blessing to everyone on earth because it's through you that I'm going to bring about the, the Messiah. Yeah. Did I see a hand? Well, it feels like to me too, but Abram didn't look at this as something for himself either. What are you going to give me? Because I have no legacy at home. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's looking longer term than just for himself. He is, yeah, he is. That's, that's fair to say. He is looking longer term, but I don't think he can imagine what god has in mind that's my that's the point i'm trying to make. i don't think he can imagine what god has in mind because it's so much bigger than i think you and i can even think even when we do think about our legacy right and it shows he's really kind of desperate too he doesn't have anything to offer god and so even this faith that he's credited for it just reinforces that god is completely other than him completely other than us that's completely bigger things like if you're gonna give me a million dollars, but I just been complaining some out of gas or something like that, you know, like it's, it's completely other. Well, and, and what he's what he's saying to uh, God here too is is unique to his culture as well because they don't count wealth the same way. If we won the lottery and we got a bunch of money, we would say, "Yay, I won the lottery! I got a bunch of money." Uh, Abram walked out of Egypt with possessions. And it doesn't matter. Why? Because in his culture, he's poor. He has no children. And that's how they count wealth. And I've told y'all this too. Whenever I'm in Tanzania, they always ask me, how many children do you have? And I say, I have one daughter. So it's only one, and she's a daughter in Africa. So they always say, oh, I'm so sorry. And they mean it like, like God has punished me or something. Because I have no sons. And I, I only have one child and I have no sons. That culture is still like that. So when he says your reward would be very great, Abram's got something to ask about because he's saying, but I'm poor. Yeah. I have no, I have no children. Um, so I have to I have to explain to my Tanzanian students that God doesn't hate me. <laughs> um, that and then I, I think I told you all this too. Did I tell you when I had to stop and put on more sunscreen? <laughs> I didn't tell you all that. So, you know, we're walking in these villages and I stopped and put on more sunscreen. And um, one of my translator asked me, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm putting on sunscreen. It blocks the rays of the sun. Why are you doing that? Because I don't have a whole lot of melanin like you do in my skin. And he was like, and, and even being a black guy, he didn't even know what that means. That, I mean, he knows what melanin is, but he's not really thought it through. And I'm like, so the sun burns me. And he's like, Pastor, I'm very sorry that God did not love you to give you our skin. <laughs> and I was like, it's okay. God loves me too. Even though he didn't give me your awesome skin. All right, anyway, I digress. 
Um, but when, when uh, look further on into chapter 15 here, okay? From verse seven to the end of the chapter, what happens? God makes what's called a suzerain covenant with Abram. I told y'all, if you look at it in writing, it looks like suzerain, it's suzerain. Um, in Abraham's culture, and this is to the general Middle East at this time, the big dog in the castle is called your suzerain. That's their word for like a, a lord, okay? The lord is the guy in the castle, right? Their word for that is suzerain. So if you make a suzerain covenant, there's a couple things that you got to know. Number one, if you want to be the vassal of the suzerain, the big dog in the castle, the lord in the castle, and you're below him in the social structure, you are not allowed to approach him and offer your services. So you can't just go up and knock on the door of the castle and say, hi, I'm a, I'm a really good herdsman. I'll multiply your flocks and herds for you. I'm a good, I'm good husbandry. And I want to offer my services to you. Can I be your, your, your servant or your vassal? Or you could be good at fighting. You can come up and say, I'm really good at fighting. I got all my own equipment and I'll fight for you if you'll make me your vassal. You can't do that. The way this works in Middle Eastern culture is the suzerain lord has to approach you as the person below him on the social scale, social ladder. So this is why it's important that God approaches Abram first. Abram never approaches God first. God approaches Abram first because that's correct. He's higher than Abram. He approaches Abram first. Okay. So again, though, this is a picture of grace because it's not that you sought God. It's that God sought you. Everybody with me? But he's doing all this in the middle of a Middle Eastern culture, and so it, it communicates in that culture. I told you on the sermon, in, in Hebrew, you cut a covenant. Like we say cut a deal. Where we get cut a deal is from the Bible, because you cut a covenant. You don't make a covenant. You cut one. Why? Because you kill an animal over it. You cut the animal in two, you lay it over the, the carcass. You lay it open like a book. And then here's the way it's supposed to work. The suzerain lord and the, the vassal to be walk through the two halves of the dead animal. And what you're supposed to be saying is, if I fail to keep my end of the bargain, because there's a, there's a contract now. As the lord, I'm going to do this, this, and this for you. As my vassal, you're going to do this, this, and this for me. And then when you walk through the dead animal, what you're saying is, may this happen to me. Like, may I also die if I ever break the terms of this agreement between the two of us? But look what happens. Verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking pot, uh, smoking. Oh, no, wait. I, well, sorry, sorry. I went, too fa I went too fast. Verse 12. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Verse 12. After Abram uh, opened up the carcasses and shoot a bunch of birds off. As the sun was going down, verse 12, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then the Lord speaks to him while he's sleeping. Then skip ahead to verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. So that's the presence of God. Everybody with me? On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the river of the blah, 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 and it keeps going on. Both parties are supposed to pass through the dead animal. Does Abram ever pass through the dead animal? So the only one who passed through the dead animal is? So the one who initiates the promise, the one who says, I personally will fulfill this promise. You don't have to do a thing. And then the one who eventually fulfills the promise, which is why all of us are sitting in here today. It is God from start to middle to finish. And Abraham believed that God who initiates, who carries it forth, and who completes it all on his own. And Abraham believed that God, and that was credited to him as righteousness. 
because in his own in, you know in his own self he's just a sinner like you and me we talked about his sins but he believed in this god who initiates who brings it to fruition who completes it all on his own and so god credited to him as if it were righteousness are you all with me As we look back at Romans chapter four, hop back to Romans chapter four. In verses four and five, you've got that language problem that I've talked to you all about before. And if you're in Romans chapter four, verses four and five of the chapter. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. Right. Anybody ever go to like your boss at work and go, thank you for the gift of my paycheck. I hope you do not do that. Because it's not a gift. It's what they owe you for your labor. OK. So um, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as is due. Here we go. Verse five. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. We're back to that language problem. Dikaiosine in Greek or tzedaka in Hebrew is the idea of righteousness. But in order to talk about making someone righteous, in English, we don't have a verb that keeps that same noun, righteousness. You can't righteous a person in English. So we have to switch to another verb and we have to say justifies the unrighteous, okay, or the ungodly in this case. But in Paul's language, what he's saying is to the one who believes in the one who can righteous an unrighteous person, in other words, make right, he turns it into a verb, who can make someone righteous who is previously unrighteous. Excuse me. Thank you. And so we're talking about a verb that he's got available to him that we don't have. God's not justifying an, un an ungodly person, meaning like explaining away or explaining away their behavior. Sometimes we use justify that way. He's making or declaring him to be righteous. Does that make sense? And this is all rooted in the righteousness of God by which he makes others righteous. But it is not about what Abraham has done or not done. It is not about Abraham's deeds, his works. It is about the righteousness of God by which he declares someone else to be righteous. Everybody with me? I was talking with a, a buddy of mine uh, this morning. Friday, we were doing a Bible study together over the over WhatsApp. It's a it's an app. You can video call people. And he lives in another state, and we were doing a Bible study together on Friday morning over coffee. And we were talking about he's from a different, he's from a different denomination than I'm from. And so he was telling me, so sometimes we share what his pastor tells him versus whatever we're reading in the Bible. And sometimes that lines up really well. And sometimes it doesn't. And one of the things that his pastor told him was, um, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're, you're no longer a sinner. Okay, easy, Lutheran. I swear, some, Hodges was over there with the keys to his pickup truck already. He's going to throw some guys with, with baseball bats in the back, and y'all are going to run. That's why I didn't tell you what state this guy lives in. He's going to remain a non -anonymous. Okay. It ain't Tennessee, but um, this buddy lives in a different southern state. Uh, Y'all going to be coming the southeast now. Anyway, so his, his, his pastor told him that if you're in Christ Jesus, you're no longer a sinner. And I said, okay, all right. I think I see where he's trying to go with that. But here, here's, here's what we say in my faith confession. We, we say it differently. We, we read our Bible, and we think it's saying this. And I went through... Simul justus et peccator. So I went through at the same time sinner and saint, right? And I went through that with him. 
And he's saying, okay, but I'm still not getting it because you're saying that it's okay to sin. And I said, I'm not saying that it's okay to sin. See, do y'all see why Paul ran into this? I mean, that's, that's just Paul's letters. And this guy's a new Christian and he hasn't read all of Paul's letters yet. But do you see why Paul has to go there? So should we say that we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Do you see why Paul has to do that? Because it is a natural question that people would ask. If you tell them that, it, that at the same time you're both a sinner and a saint, the next question obviously comes, then are you telling me that it's okay to sin as a Christian? And I said, no, and that's not what I'm telling you. It's not what I'm telling you at all. I'm telling you that there's a distinction between the promise that God has made to us and the, and the ultimate fulfillment of that promise at Christ's second coming. I said, for the Lutheran, we don't believe that Jesus died for us to pay for our sins. And then the second coming is sort of an afterthought. As Lutherans, we believe that Jesus has died to pay for our sins. Therefore, we are declared, as in Romans, to be righteous. But in this life, we're still in this body and we're still continuing to sin. We don't go about trying to sin, but it's going to happen. And then what happens at the second coming is that Christ will fulfill that ultimate promise, giving us a new body, a glorified body like his resurrection body. And then what's funny is we're not going to sin anymore. And there is a distinction that we make, I told him, between the giving of that promise and the down payment of it, the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit in our lives at baptism. Paul even calls the spirit the down payment, doesn't he? So there's a difference between that promise being made, a down payment being made, and the ultimate fulfilling of that promise when Christ comes. Again, I said for the Lutheran, the second coming of Christ is not an afterthought. The second coming of Christ is what we're all looking forward to. That's the goal. It's the resurrection. And so we have a different way that we're understanding what we're reading in Scripture. Steve, let me catch up with you after, after service. Steve, um, I might be off topic here a little bit. When I taught, I had to have students come in and talk about how their faith was weak. And I always struggled a little bit with what they meant or how, how to respond to that. And that may not be related to this at all, but um, kind of like what your guy was talking about. They, 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 they didn't want the tension to sit between what God had done yeah. and that faith strength and what they failed to do daily. That's, that's the issue. They didn't want to leave the tension. His preacher didn't want to leave the tension between what God has already done and what it feels like to keep struggling in this life day in, day out, and to rely on what God has done and not on what we are able to do. So the good news, I told it, so this is where we ended that conversation together. I said, the good news is not uh, you were a sinner and God has now made it to where you're not a sinner. The good news is that you are a sinner and God has now declared you to be righteous through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. In other words, the good news is that you are still a sinner, but you have been forgiven of that sin. You have been forgiven of the debt that you owe. That is the good news. Because someone else paid the debt that you owed. Someone else took the punishment in your place. That's Jesus who died on the cross for you. And so we had this really awesome moment where we could talk about what is the gospel versus what is not the gospel. The gospel is not that God has empowered you to be this perfect person. The, the gospel, the good news is that you are forgiven. You're never going to have to pay that debt because Jesus paid it for you. Okay, so that's what we're talking about when we say it's out of God's righteousness that he declares someone to be righteous. Now, verse nine credited, and then I've given you the, the Greek, so you know I'm not making this up. Uh, it's hard for me to say because I got to get my southern tongue moving. Um, it's an economic term from Greco-Roman economic theory. Where, so why bring that up? Paul is using terms that Romans would understand. It'd be like if you tried to talk to somebody about, I don't know, an investment on Wall Street, or you used a term like hedge fund to try to help someone understand God and his relationship with us. What I'm trying to... to to make sure we don't do is I don't want us to read Paul and to read him as um, 
not speaking to a particular culture in a particular time and place. He is. And you know he is because he's using everyday terminology, not theological speak. So when he says that it was credited to him as righteousness, he means that as the metaphor that it sounds like he means it as. That's not theological language. That's regular old dollars and cents language. So my question to us today is how can God credit faith as if it were righteousness? Because faith and righteousness are not the same thing. How is it that God can credit faith as if it were righteousness? He's the banker. He's the judge. Okay, so for one, this is for what we call forensic. It's outside of ourselves, like a judge. Or I've said before they ruined baseball with the instant replay, which should never be part of baseball. It's whatever the umpire says. He could be out as out can be. All of Yankee Stadium saw the dude was out. But if the ump says he's safe, guess what? He's safe. And that's what was awesome about baseball, for they ruined it. No place in baseball. Um, so for one, the language is about a judge declaring something to be the case. It just is a legal fact, right? But how else is it that God can credit faith as if it were righteousness? What does that mean to credit someone? Now, we don't have the same economic theory as the, as the Greeks and the Romans. We have a different system. Lately, ours isn't working very well. But anyway, theirs didn't work very well all the time either, by the way. They had big crashes and stuff. Um, so it's not like they were smarter than us. But what, what does this mean then to give someone a line of credit? I said this isn't theological language. This is dollars and cents. If you went to the bank to get a line of credit, what are they saying? I trust you up to X amount. So what does it mean that God credits him as if he were righteous? Does he trust, trust, does he trust Well, does he trust in Abraham? Yeah. Ah, well, whoop, there, ah, there it was. Who does God trust in this line of credit? It ain't Abraham. Who does he trust in this line of credit? Jesus, because he knows that the plan is to send his son to die and to rise again. So he extends Abraham a line of credit ahead of the crucifixion event. Do y'all see that? That is the theological word for it. That is awesome. Yeah. So how can God credit your faith as righteousness? He's not crediting it on account of you. Who is he crediting it to you on account of? Jesus. It's a good Sunday school answer. It happens to be right. He can credit your faith as your righteousness because of what Jesus did, not because you're so faithful in believing. Even at the point of faith, it is all God's doing. From start to middle to finish. Yeah, Stu. Is that the answer to Joel's question about his kids? That is the answer to Joel's question about his kids. He say, my faith is weak. Congratulations. Welcome to planet Earth and to being human. My faith is weak too sometimes. What we're being credited is not on account of us, whether it's good works, whether it's how, how amazingly you believe. None of it's being credited to you on your own account. It's being it, the line of credit. This is just dollars and cents language. The line of credit is being extended to you on account of what Jesus has accomplished. Whether you live before the cross or after the cross, it's still being credited to you on account of what Jesus accomplishes in his cross and empty tomb. Isn't that amazing? So the reason your salvation is sure has nothing to do with you. The reason your salvation is sure is because it all has to do with Jesus. All he's doing is taking you to Jesus. 
Yeah. It's the same thing as like, why do you Lutherans say that baptism saves? Because baptism gives you Jesus. Baptism saves because Jesus saves. And baptism gives you Jesus. Why does your pastor go on about y'all should read your Bible more? Because your Bible gives you Jesus. Jesus. I'm a big fan. I'm going to get a t-shirt made. Okay? Even in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, because the New Testament hadn't been written yet, and Jesus was teaching people from the Old Testament. It's all counted to you as righteousness. You, you, you make that real in your own life by your faith, but it's not being counted to you because of your faith. It's being counted to you as a line of credit because Jesus is good for it, and he'll pay it. It's a line of credit that Jesus pays the bill. That's the metaphor. And it's just a dollars and cents metaphor. That's why I'm making a big deal out of this. Is it, People read Paul in churches. Oh, it's Paul. Let us use theological language. Paul's not using theological language. He's using dollars and cents language from the marketplace. Abraham is being extended a line of credit on the basis of the work of the son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Even the words Yahweh is using is God. Jesus yeah. is. So he's even Jesus in the covenant and our terms. He's, he's doubly Jesus in the covenant. He's so meta and he doesn't even know it. I love it. All right. I love y'all. Jesus loves y'all. Get out of here. Go away. I'll see you next week. Oh, wait. What's your homework? Here's your homework. Chapter four, the rest of it, 13 through 25. 13 through 25. See y'all next week. Bye.